All right, greetings everybody. Uh, what I want to do now is talk about the evolution of the primates. Um, this is strictly a video lecture, uh, not in person. Um, I'm afraid that can't be helped at the moment, uh, but I still want to get through this material. Um, I will have some announcements on the web page uh, concerning the midterm exam, so look for that um, as we go forward. All right, let's begin talking about the primates. Uh, and the first point that I want to make about primates um, is that, as you'll recall from our discussion of uh, insectivores um, and tupiads, that these animals have sort of a very generalized body plan. And the body plan is one that is geared towards arboreality. So all of the characteristics that we use to define the tupiads and those early uh, insectivore types of animals apply here to the primates as well. Um, and what that means is that it is, uh, to some extent, difficult to sort of define what the unique uh, adaptations of the group are. But the morphological attributes that the primates have are primarily associated with some level of arboreality. There are other attributes that we associate with um, the primates, and those are um, associated with the teeth. Uh, for example, the teeth tend to be bunodont and brachydont rather than hypsodont. Uh, brachydont, well, bunodont to begin with, that refers to teeth that are rounded to some extent, so you don't have these very sharp cusps, you have very generalized cusps, uh, so rolling hills instead of craggy mountains. Um, and then, in addition to that, the teeth are brachydont, brachydont rather than hypsodont, uh, hypsodont teeth are high-crowned teeth, and brachydont teeth are low-crowned teeth. Uh, so the teeth of primates don't stick up all that far above the gum line. Uh, importantly, uh, primates exhibit specializations of the hands and digits. Uh, if you look at the extremities of the digits, there are both nails and claws rather than just claws. Uh, they have pads, um, and I know that dogs and cats have pads as well, but uh, if you look at your own hands, you'll notice these pads at the bases of your digits. Uh, and there are also ridges, and these attributes uh, are associated with the primates. Importantly, all primates have um, a postorbital bar, that is, this, boning, this bone that goes across the posterior margin of the eye. Uh, and in addition to that, the eyes are facing forward, so they all have some degree of binocularity. Now, clearly some more than others, um, but they all exhibit some level of binocularity. Um, and that is associated primarily with being arboreal. If you're arboreal, and especially if you're a vertical clinger and leaper, um, it's important to be able to judge uh, distances very accurately, and if you don't have binocular vision, that's exceedingly difficult to do. Uh, the next component of primates that is important in, is the fact that the cerebral cortex is much larger than it is in other uh, vertebrate groups. Uh, so I'm not talking about the cerebellum. The cerebellum is well developed as well, uh, but the cerebral cortex, that is that part of the brain uh, on for example, on your head, on the top of your head, that's where all of those sulci are located, all that folding on the surface of the brain. Uh, that's where all your quote-unquote gray matter is. Uh, that's where your centers of higher cognitive thinking are located. So uh, primates have a much greater amount of that material relative to other mammals, uh, and that indicates that primates uh, have somewhat greater cognitive skills than other mammals. Now, that's not strictly true when we talk about cetaceans. We'll see that that relationship breaks down a little bit. Um, but uh, primates have um, better cognition than most uh, other mammals. Uh, the next thing to pay attention to is that uh, the degree of olf olfactory capabilities in primates is somewhat reduced. Uh, when we were talking about carnivores, uh, we noted this distinction between cats and dogs. Uh, cats have a very short rostrum, dogs have a very long rostrum, so dogs have a great deal of nasal epithelium while cats do not, and the consequence is that cats have uh, a very good sense of smell while, uh, I'm sorry, uh, dogs have a very good sense of smell while cats do not. Um, 
that's again why they use dogs as as to track uh, missing people or drugs or whatever they don't use cats um, so what this illustrates clearly is that primates have a very poor sense of smell relative to other vertebrate groups uh, that's both a blessing and a curse I suppose um, it's good that we can't smell each other to the degree that a dog can all right, uh, next is that the diets on um, primates uh, tend towards omnivory and or herbivory or frugivory. Um, and the other important component of primates is the degree of sociality. Now, there are clearly some primates which are not very social, um, but you see within the primates a wide variety of mating systems and social systems. And we'll talk about that in just a little more detail uh, momentarily. Um, when we look at the teeth, so here are here is an example of the Bunodont teeth, and uh, I know that we haven't talked at any great length about teeth, um, but if you look at these uh, teeth, uh, above uh, uh, we have the the ME stands for metacone, PA for paracone, HY for hypocone, and then PR for protocone. HYD is the hypocondylid, uh, endocondylid. Um, uh, the protocondylid condylid, and MED escapes me at the moment, um, metacondylid. All right, so these are uh, just those uh, four cones that appear on our teeth for the upper tooth and for the lower tooth. Um, it becomes really complicated when we start talking about rodents, and um, but these are important taxonomic tools. If you really want to understand the evolution of mammals, what you have to do is you have to understand the morphology of these teeth. Um, and especially, for example, when we talk about the rodents, uh, an important point is that almost 95% of all the fossils for um, rodents that we have are simply teeth and nothing more. All right, in this illustration, uh, you can see what I'm talking about when I talk about that post orbital bar. Um, so here for this very generalized primate skull, it's probably a lemur, I don't uh, recall exactly. Uh, but you can see on the left the uh, illustration for the orbit, and then right behind that is the post-orbital bar, and you have precisely that as well. So that post-orbital bar, if you look at the illustration in the center, uh, arises up from the zygomatic arch and then goes up above the top of the skull. If you were to look at a skull for a squirrel, um, that post-orbital bar would be incomplete. And for most mammals, that post-orbital bar is incomplete. So there's a nice defining characteristic for a post-orbital bar. If you pick up a skull that has a complete post-orbital bar, then the thing that should cross your mind is that it's potentially a primate. All right, so let's now talk a little bit about um, primate evolution, and we right away run into an issue with how we um, classify the primates. Initially, primates were divided into prosimians and, and anthropoids, um, but when you do that, you end up with some very unnatural groups of primates. So we have a new system now. It's not that new, but uh, the system that we use today divides the primates instead into the groups strepsirines and haplorines. So the haplorines include the tarsiers and the simians. The strepsirines include the lemurs and the lorises. Now, you can look at this phylogenetic tree um, and you can sort of get a sense for uh, what we're talking about. Um, and there are a couple of other things that I want to point out to you here as well. So let's look at uh, this phylogenetic tree and there are a couple of, it's, it's a sort of a, an old school way of illustrating a phylogenetic tree. Um, but let's look at this tree, and uh, I want to point out a couple of things. Uh, first of all, uh, notice that we have the lemurs and the lorises over here on the left, going all the way up to the Pleistocene. Uh, and on the right, we have the tarsiers, the new world monkeys, the old world monkeys, uh, the lesser apes and the greater apes, which obviously includes um, the humans. On the far left, um, though, you see this group that dies out by the end of the Eocene, and it includes two important uh, groups, the Paramomyids um, and the Plesiodapids. Uh, the Paramomyids are interesting. 
um, because that was a group that had relatively long appendages. And there are also some fossils that indicated that these animals had um, patagia. So there is this possibility that these um, paramomyids were actually gliding primates. Uh, the reason that's interesting, if you'll recall our discussion of the um, colugos and the dermopterans, um, one of the ideas for the evolution of flight and flight is the fact that these uh, dermopterans, the colugos are arboreal, um, much like a primate would be arboreal, um, and they have these nice extensive patagia with these with these long appendages, and they're able to glide. And, and the hypothesis is that their digits got longer and longer, and the webbing between the fingers then produced this um, this flight surface that ultimately leads to the big bats. And recall too our discussion of where the bats come from, and it all ties back to those early insectivores. So the idea is here that here is an example of where that might have been taking place. But of course, um, the evidence for all of that is pretty thin. All right, so uh, the plesiodapids and the paramomyids, and we care about that simply because of their um, long appendages and the possibility, at least based on these fossils, uh, that they were gliding forms. All right, um, the other thing I want to point out when we're looking at primates, if you look at the floor of the auditory bullae, um, you'll notice that it's covered by uh, the petrosal bone, and you don't see that in other mammalian groups. Uh, another thing that turns up is that the dentary bone is not particularly mobile, so it's not like a carnivore uh, where the dentary bone is totally locked into place and has no lateral movement. Um, it's somewhat loose. I mean, you can take your lower jaw and move it side to side without too much difficulty, uh, but it doesn't have the same degree of freedom that you find in rodents or in lagomorphs, for that matter. Uh, so that's important. We do have some lateral mobility, but not as much as you find in rodents. Now, um, does that mean that uh, we're somehow more advanced in the rodents? No, it doesn't. Uh, in the rodents, that ability to move the jaw laterally is probably um, a modern ability, so it's a derived characteristic, uh, which is one of the reasons why the rodents have been so successful. Um, next, primates uh, tend to be plantigrade. Now, we've talked about this a little bit. I've made the distinction between plantigrade and digitigrade. Uh, animals that are digitigrade walk on their toes, like dogs and cats and horses, right? Animals that are plantigrade walk on their feet. Uh, so, uh, like a bear or like you. So, you're walking, You when you put your foot down, your heel makes contact with the ground. Uh, you're walking on the sole of your foot. And if you were quadrupedal, you'd be walking on your hands as well. Um, now, there are some forms that have lost the hallux uh, and or the pollex, so the thumb or the great toe, um, and one of the other things that you begin to see in the primates is that there is this opposability of those digits, too. Now, that's not modern, right? That isn't, I mean, the marsupials have that in spades. Uh, so that really doesn't make primates special, but it certainly does assist when it comes to arboreality. All right, so the earliest, earliest fossils of primates date back to the Cretaceous, so it's quite old, of Europe and North America. So that's important. Um, so primates have this northern origin. Um, interestingly, uh, Plesiodapus, so one of these Plesiodapids, uh, lacks a postorbital bar, um, was relatively small and very squirrel-like. Um, the tibia and fibula are separate, which allows rotation of the hind limb. Uh, why is that important? Well, if you're a vertical clinger and leaper, or if you're arboreal and moving from branch to branch, uh, that turns out to be uh, critical. If you think, for example, about how a gray squirrel comes down a tree trunk, uh, look, watch a gray squirrel at some point when it's coming down a tree trunk rather than going up. And what you'll notice is that the hind feet have been rotated 180 degrees, so they're going backwards. It's hanging by its claws as it's coming down. Uh, not like a cat, which is unable to do that. So that uh, separation of the uh, fibula and the and the tibia allows that rotation. Um, the digits tend to be long, um, and terminal digits uh, for plesiodapus at least have claws uh, and not nails. So the claws is a 
is an underived characteristic. Nails are um, derived. Uh, so here you see a fossil of Plesiodapus. Uh, some of the material is drawn in. Um, so the, the gray stuff, the dark stuff is, is what's missing. Um, the stuff that is just pen and ink, uh, not grayed in, uh, that's the material that we have. Uh, and one thing I want you to notice uh, right off the bat are, first of all, the body proportions. It does have hind limb dominance, right, which makes sense. Um, but also take a peek at that skull. Um, so, well, let me go back here. Uh, look at that skull. We'll talk about this uh, a little bit later. But when you look at that skull, a uh, couple of things to note. Number one, uh, look at the dentary bone and see that relatively large masseteric fossa. So these are animals that are using the masseter muscles to a large degree, uh, much like rodents would. But importantly, um, look at those lower incisors, how they're procumbent, they're pointing forward. Um, that too is the sort of thing that you see in insectivores, and later you see that in rodents, although rodents do it somewhat differently. Um, but importantly, notice the gap between the incisors and the tooth row, the cheek teeth, the premolars and the molars. That kind of a gap is referred to as a diastema. Diastemas are apparent in animals that are plant eating. So you tend to see a diastema in animals that eat plant material. So here that's a pretty clear indication that this is an herbivorous animal. And of course, we could look at the teeth to uh, confirm that. So uh, that's what we're inferring from the skull. Um, number one, uh, that this animal has this um, diastema. So it's it's more likely than not that it has some sort of a herbivorous diet. Um, the teeth are procumbent, so it may be cutting stuff open, bark or something of that sort. Uh, and then also, let's look at the size of the brain case. So let's go back and look at the brain case. The brain case is relatively small. Um, so this obviously is an early primate. The um, cerebrum um, has not developed like it does in modern primates. This is a very rodent-like or squirrel-like kind of a brain case. And if you look at that skull, uh, the skull looks very squirrel-like or very marmot-like. All right. Let's skip ahead just a little bit. Um, I want to forego a lot of that fossil um, material. Um, and uh, let's just look at two skulls here. The one on the left is an adapid, so that is derived from the uh, plesiadapids. Uh, and the first thing that you notice is the change in the size of the brain case, so it is considerably larger. And notice, too, that the diastema is gone and the procumbent um, incisors are um, not quite as dramatic as they were in the plesiadapids. Um, the anaptomorphid on the right, Tetonius, if you look at that, that begins to look much more like a modern uh, primate skull. So the very large rounded brain case. Um, the teeth, especially at the front of the mouth, don't look very much like, for example, an ape or a great ape, something of that sort. But they aren't all that different from the sorts of teeth that you see in some of the other primates. And, and we'll go through some of those momentarily. Um, but here, both of these forms are much more primate-like. And notice, too, that both of these have that complete post-orbital bar. Um, so it seems pretty clear that these animals have good binocular vision, um, indicating that they are arboreal. All right, uh, so uh, when we're talking about the evolution of primates, uh, one important consideration is the fossil record. Uh, and uh, there, it's uh, important to have some sort of sense of the whole process of fossilization. Uh, just the fact that an animal dies uh, and ends up being covered up by dirt doesn't mean that it's going to turn into a fossil. Uh, becoming a fossil is actually a, a pretty rare event. Uh, and uh, if you think about most fossils or, or most primates, they occupy, currently at least, habitats that are tropical or subtropical. Uh, and what that means is the chances of fossilization are not particularly good. Uh, fossilization is probably better for animals that are uh, living close to the ground rather than animals that are arboreal. So there are all sorts of things working against uh, fossilization of primates. 
Uh, if we look at um, some of the New World families of primates, and those would include the calothricids and the cebids, so the families calothricidae and cebidae, uh, their modern distribution is in South and Central America. So these are the New World primates, and they have a relatively poor fossil record. Uh, the Cercopithecids, uh, those are the Old World primates, um, their fossil record is somewhat better. Um, and we know that their distribution occurs all the way from the Oligocene all the way through uh, to recent, to the recent epoch. All right, um, if we look at Peripithecus, uh, it has a condyle which is relatively high on the ascending ramus, um, which is very similar to that of modern Cercopithecid primates. Um, and those animals are ancestral to the hylobatids and the hominids, so to the um, hylobates and, and the great apes. Um, whoops, what's going on with my monitor? I think. There we go. All right. Uh, this computer is um, showing signs of aging. Uh, I can't do much about that at the moment. All right, so uh, that then brings us to this question, uh, did primates evolve in the trees or on the ground? Uh, if you look at all of the morphological things that we've talked about up to this point, uh, the degree of hind limb dominance, uh, the presence of that post-orbital bar, uh, the dietary considerations, uh, it all seems to indicate that primates uh, do have an arboreal origin. Remember too that when we, when we talked about the um, tupiads, and the earliest uh, mammals, which are rel the earliest placental mammals, which were relatively small, uh, we noted the fact that these guys were arboreal, they were getting up into trees, uh, and I think that's probably how the primates began as well. All right, so here's Myopithecus, uh, and there you can see it has a nice modern kind of a skull, a very primate looking skull, and hind limb dominance and all of that and relatively long limbs, and all of that is consistent with uh, arboreality. Uh, so for forelimbs, you might ask the question, why is it that um, forelimbs, having long forelimbs, would be important for um, an arboreal animal? And it's actually pretty simple. Uh, if you think about a tree and you're trying to climb the tree trunk, uh, think about how a telephone lineman climbs a telephone pole. Um, they obviously have cleats on their on their boots that they dig into the pole with, or they, they have spikes or something. But then what they have to do with their front appendages, with their hands, is they have to grab the side of the, of the pole. If your limbs are relatively short and you can't reach around to the sides of this pole that you're trying to climb, it's going to be very hard because all the force that you apply to the pole is going to push you away from the pole and you run the risk of falling. So the longer your front appendages can be, the farther out to the side you can get, right? And therefore, um, the greater efficiency you have when you're trying to climb. Okay, so um, let's talk about the strepsorines. There are, uh, re recall that there are two groups of primates, right? The strepsorines and the haplorines. Um, the strepsorines are uh, in Madagascar, um, primarily in Madagascar. There are seven families. Uh, Madagascar uh, geographically is off the southern eastern coast of um, Africa. Uh, so it's a large, large island, uh, which turns out in the evolution of mammals turns out to be uh, very unique. So the number of different groups of mammals that are on uh, Madagascar are truly amazing. And there are a lot of families that show up on Madagascar that exists nowhere else. So biogeographically, Madagascar is important. Um, but at any rate, the strep shrines, those are what we used to refer to as the prosimians. Uh, those are the lemurs and the lorises. Um, they differ from the uh, haplorines by, um, they have a, a, what's referred to as a rhinarium. And I'm gonna show you an illustration of what that looks like in just a moment. Um, but in addition to that, they possess a bicornate uterus. So the uterus has two horns rather than just uh, one uterus, as you would find in people, right? So uh, human females and chimpanzees and uh, orangutans and gorillas just have one uh, uterus. And these guys, there are two uterine horns. Uh, the dental formula is um, underived. So it's um, 2211333.
Um, the placenta is non-invasive uh, epithelial corial. Um, so what that means is it doesn't have the same degree of implantation that you find in um, in other sorts of, of uh, mammals. So it, it's more of a reptilian-like or, or uh, marsupial-like placenta than it is like the placenta that uh, we typically think of when we think of a, um, a modern mammal. So there is not a lot of folding, uh, not, not a lot of invagination uh, in that placenta. Uh, and not surprisingly, then the young are relatively small compared to the females, so they're they're not well developed like you find in others, the more little bean-like sorts of things. And, and all of those traits are plesiomorphic, so they are underived, and those are the characters that we use to unite the strepsirines. Um, and the strepsirines are more likely than not a monophyletic group. All right. So here's an illustration showing you what the rhinarium looks like. Uh, if you look at the illustration at the top, the front of the nose is naked. Okay, so there is no fur there. Um, in illustration, um, uh, in the center, um, you see that the 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 rhinarium or that nose is is well furred. Um, in the top, it's not. And you think to yourself, well, the front of my nose isn't furry, right? So I have a rhinarium, so that puts me in with these guys, with the strepsirines. And no, that's not true. Uh, if you were to get out a magnifying glass and look very carefully at the surface of your nose, you'd find these little tiny hairs all over the all over your nose. Okay, it's just they're really small. Um, but in these guys, the nose is more like that of a dog or a cat, right? Where there is no fur growing on that the tip of that nose between the two nostrils. All right, so here then uh, we can see how all of these different primates break down. Uh, the strepsirines on the left there, those include, include the lemurs, uh, which are from Madagascar, and then the lorises, which are African and Asian. Uh, they're small, nocturnal, um, things like bush babies and galagos and things of that sort. Uh, the haplorines, uh, the group that you see on the right there, um, that includes the platyrines, uh, and the platyrines are sort of interesting because those are these South American primates where the, the nares, the nostrils, actually point out to the sides. Um, also a very diverse group includes tamarins, uh, the marmosets, spider monkeys, and night monkeys. Um, if you look at the catarines, uh, there the nostrils point down, so those are the old world monkeys, the apes and the humans. Um, and notice that... Um, we've sort of separated humans and apes, and that's probably not a, a, a true a representation of what's going on. It's politically correct, but it's not really what's going on. Uh, humans and apes should be united, so there's really no reason why uh, humans should be separated from gorillas and the chimpanzees. Um, the differences between humans and apes are trivial um, and if it were not for political pressure from the from the religious right, uh, we would clearly be uh, grouped together with the apes. All right, so uh, here's an example of a, of a lemur. Um, there are lemurs at the St. Louis Zoo. Um, at the San Diego Zoo, they have representatives of all species of lemurs. Uh, and lemurs are important uh, in terms of our understanding of animal behavior and primate behavior in particular. Um, so these guys exhibit mating systems that are everything from monogamous to polygynous. Um, and in terms of uh, people that are trying to understand animal behavior, this is usually a good starting point. Um, then you have things like uh, tarsiers and lorises. Uh, these animals tend to have very large um, eyes, and that's obviously associated with two things. Uh, number one is binocularity, and the other one is the ability um, to have good uh, depth perception and the ability to see at night. Uh, another thing that I want you to draw your attention to is notice the opposability of the digits on both the hands and the feet. All right, so let's go over a few of the uh, strepsirines. Um, the Daupentoniidae, uh, these are the IIs, um, and these are from Madagascar, so it's a monotypic group. There's just the one, uh, one genus and one species. Um, these are from the same ancestral stock as the lemurs and the lorises. They're solitary, nocturnal, insectivorous, a lowland forest of Madagascar. Um, and 
when I pull up the next slide, uh, pay attention to those long fingers uh, and what they do with that. Um, these guys are almost extinct, um, and their, their fate is uh, a consequence not only of the loss of climate or loss of uh, habitat as a result of um, a very poor country uh, trying desperately to survive. If there's a lot of poverty, there's a lot of uh, subsistence agriculture. Uh, and what these poor people in Madagascar are doing is slash and burn agriculture where they'll cut down a, some forest and try and grow crops for a short period and then that fails and then they cut down a little more forest and so on. So the forests in Madagascar are disappearing at a phenomenal rate. Uh, the other aspect of um, unfortunate aspect for eye eyes is that the local the locals view them as evil so they think they are evil spirits uh, and they are actively trying to um, exterminate the eye eyes uh, if you look at the skull of an eye eye uh, notice a couple of things uh, first, first of all notice the incisors both lower and upper and notice the general shape of the skull uh, and the first thing that should come to your mind is a vampire bat. Um, so these teeth are designed sort of like for slicing. Um, it's very bat-like, with the exception, obviously, that it has big eyes and, and a post-orbital bar and binocular vision. So that's one important component to this. It's a very unique kind of dentition. Uh, and then if you look at this, notice that, um, notice that very long third finger. Um, that what the animal does is it uses that finger to tap on uh, the side of a tree or a, a fallen log or something, uh, and it listens for the sound. So it's attempting to hear this sort of echo which is coming off from that sound, and it uses the quality of that sound to determine if there are insects that are infested uh, in that log or in that uh, snag. Uh, so it's part of their feeding strategy. Uh, and it is really cool if you ever get the opportunity to see one of these doing that tapping routine. It is very cool. Um, the other thing that uh, I want to draw your attention to, there you see the um, the hand on the left with that long skinny finger, which is used for tapping. Uh, and then you notice the um, the foot. Uh, you'll notice that the, ha the, um, the toe uh, has a nail. Everything else has claws. So the hand has all claws. On the foot, though, you've got nails and then a claw in addition to that. And it has both opposable great toes and opposable thumbs. Um, so if you're thinking about the cool thing about humans is that we have a, opposable thumbs. Big deal, right? Lots of animals have opposable thumbs and opposable toes as well. So it's not all that special. All right, um, let's now look at the lorids. Um, those are the lorises and pottos. There are four genera and six species. They're uh, sub-Saharan Africa, India, Southeast Asia, Indonesia, and the Philippines. Uh, they have these small flattened faces, which is probably all associated with arboreality, right? The eyes are going to be um, facing forward. And then the polex is 180 degrees uh, offset from all of the other digits, so it's semi-opposable. Um, uh, and you can see that here. Um, on the left, you see how um, that little, uh, the polex down there at the bottom is just hanging down, right? So this whole hand, right, is in this really kind of weird sort of structure. Uh, notice the foot on the right, and notice that everything has nails except for that second toe, right? There's this little claw on that thing. Uh, and you see that in a couple of other primates, and that's referred to as a toilet claw. Uh, so what the animal does is it uses that to groom itself um, after it's had a bowel movement. Well, if you're herbivorous and you're eating a lot of plant material, um, your fecal material is going to be very different, right? It's going to, it's just fundamentally going to be different. And they're using this to clean their fur and get all the goopy stuff out of their fur so they don't, they don't get rashes, I suppose. Um, at any rate, these lorises are um, uh, are either frugivorous and or insectivorous. Um, they can be either single or live in pairs. And the cool thing is that both vocalizations and facial expressions are important to these. More about that when we talk about the great apes. Uh, and they're also doing a lot of scent marking. So um, with these animals, there is both vocal communication, but there is also non-vocal communication going on. And that, too, is something that turns out to be important for humans. 
All right, the Galagos are the bush babies. Um, it was popular at one time in the United Kingdom uh, for rich kids to have uh, bush babies as pets. Um, they're called bush babies because uh, one of their vocalizations sounds like a crying baby. Um, these are vertical clingers and leapers, and if you want to see good examples of that, you can find uh, vertical clinging and leaping bush babies, galagos, uh, on YouTube. It's really cool. Um, they have they range in size from 60 grams all the way up to you know, 1.2 kilos. Um, they are they are excellent when they're when they jump, man. They just they follow that ballistics equation it is really cool so they have all these morphological ad adaptations designed for vertical clinging and leaping you should watch some of those videos on youtube it's cool all right uh, here's another example of a small uh, bush baby this is a, um, a really tiny little guy it's the smallest of them all um, uh, both in terms of weight and in terms of head and body length uh, and it's also relatively underived, but it looks very, uh, almost not exactly mouse-like, but uh, certainly smaller than a lemur and, and uh, almost squirrel-like slash mouse-like slash um, shrew-like. All right, um, so galagos, they live in groups uh, that are up to nine animals or so. Um, they have facial expressions and they're using body posture and all of that sort of stuff. So it, it's uh, another interesting group uh, to explore in terms of um, the evolution of behavior. Uh, if you look at the teeth, um, the one thing I want to point out, uh, look at the cheek teeth. So those are the premolars and the molars. Uh, the tooth that is labeled PM, that is the first premolar. The tooth in front of that is the canine. So notice what these animals have done. Uh, typically, they have just two incisors, and here you have a third incisor added to each side, which is really nothing more than the canine tooth. Uh, so the canine tooth has become what's called um, incisiform. So it's been modified to be more like an incisor. So you might ask yourself, why would they do that? What is the selective advantage of adding a tooth to the incisor row? That's sort of a curious thing to ponder. And, and clearly, it's something related to either diet or grooming. Uh, so here you see the skull. And the first thing that should cross your mind, aside from the fact that it's a relatively large brain case and they have binocular vision by virtue of the post-orbital bar, um, is that that skull looks has a strong resemblance to the skull of a tree shrew. So it is, you, you see again, this, this nice strong relationship between that lineage from tree shrews and insectivores all the way up uh, to primates. So these are the basal mammals, right? The guys that are um, sort of that uh, sort of generalized body form. All right, so let's... Um, talk about, uh, continue on with the strepsorines now and, and talk about um, the lemurs. Uh, there are four genera and ten species, uh, so they're distributed in um, Madagascar only, nowhere else. Um, when are they active? Anytime. Uh, I mean, there are different species. Not every species is active at all hours, but uh, they can be diurnal, uh, which means active during the day, crepuscular, which means uh, dawn and dusk, um, they are arboreal. Um, some time, some they will spend some time on the ground, and you certainly realize that when you go to the St. Louis Zoo and watch uh, the lemurs. They have a couple different species there. Um, they differ from other strep shrines by the fact that they have relatively small eyes, and that's associated with uh, di um, diurnality, uh, so being active during the day. Um, and the rostrum also tends to be a little bit smaller than it is in some of the other primates. Uh, they're frugivorous, they eat flowers, uh, they eat vegetation as well. Um, and if you'll think back to the skull that we just looked at, um, the lower incisors and canines are procumbent and form this uh, dental comb that they use for grooming. It's not just grooming themselves, but it's also aloe grooming. Uh, aloe grooming is a behavior uh, where you groom another animal. Um, or you groom it. For example, if you were to groom another person, you might ask yourself, why would you do that? Well, a, a mother or a father might uh, brush the hair of their children. 
Um, if you're in a relationship with somebody, you might brush their hair. You know, I mean, those are all allo-grooming sorts of things. Uh, allo-grooming is important in terms of establishing social structure um, and uh, ensuring that relationships between individuals within the social system uh, are strong. So allo-grooming is one of the things that we look for uh, when we're trying to understand the evolution of animal behavior. Um, amongst the lemurs, they all have ear tufts, so little tufts of fur sticking up off the tops of the ears. Why that should be advantageous, I have no idea. Um, it would be something worth exploring. Um, there are, uh, ewe lemur um, has sexual dichromatism, so uh, males and females are different colors, which is unusual um, in primates. Um, all of them use uh, leaping and clinging uh, forms of locomotion, uh, with the exception of the, um, the ringtail lemur. Um, the ringtail lemur is quadrupedal and climb, so it's not a vertical clinger and leaper. Um, the social groups range in size um, up to 20 animals, and again, they use scent marking, urine marking. Uh, they have sternal glands, uh, so that's right on top of the, the sternum. Uh, cutaneous arm glands, so glands in their armpits. Um, they use all of that to communicate just as humans use those same sorts of things for communication. Uh, the fact that you stink underneath your armpits, that is pheromonal information that uh, members of the opposite sex use to evaluate your um, receptiveness. Um, in addition to that, they use uh, vocal communication, but they also use posture and facial communication. So there is nonverbal or nonvocal communication taking place in these animals as well. Um, the Megalodapidae, those are the sportive lemurs. Um, they're nocturnal and arboreal. Um, they eat leaves, bark, fruit, and flowers. They are vertical clingers and leapers, um, and they're solitary. There's some scent and urine marking. Um, they do have extensive vocal communication, uh, but they don't have the sort of complicated social systems that you find in the other lemurs. Uh, the Chirogalidae, uh, those are the dwarf and mouse lemurs. Uh, there are four genera and seven species. All of them are in Madagascar. Um, they have good binocularity. The eyes are large, face forward. Um, they're both arboreal and nocturnal. Um, their their uh, locomotor form is more squirrel-like than anything else, although Microcebus is a leaper. Uh, Microcebus is an insectivore, um, but can also eat fruit. These guys are solitary or paired. Um, and again, just like the other lemur, lemurs, they use posture, facial communication, vocal communication, um, but to a lesser degree than what you find in the other strepsirines. Uh, the Indrids, uh, there are three genera and five species. Again, all of them in Madagascar, all of them nocturnal, and all of them arboreal. Um, that includes a group uh, of primates that look a lot like me. So if you think about what I look like um, with this bald head that's really red when you come in out of the sun, right? That's what these guys look like. Look for a primate that has this bald red head and you're looking at a safaka, okay? Um, these guys eat leaves, fruit, flowers, and bark. They're also vertical clingers and leapers, um, and they also have hind limb dominance. Uh, they live in groups, small groups, and they use scent marking, facial uh, communication, uh, and to some degree vocal communication as well. Um, here's an indrid. Um, these are good vertical clingers and leapers. Um, look at the hands of these guys. So A is a lemur. Um, B is a safaka. Uh, so um, the C is the I, I, and then uh, D is the pato, or the it's a lord. Okay. Um, so there you see, particularly when you look at uh, D, there you see that toilet claw. And when you look at the I, I, the thing to pay attention to is that finger, that very skinny finger that they use for tapping um, snags. Let's move on to the second group of primates now. Uh, these are the haplorines, uh, and um, let's go back over that sort of clustering that we looked at earlier. So you see the strepsirines on the left of the image. Uh, those are the lemurs and lorises again. And then the haplorines include the tarsiers, the catarines, uh, which includes the old world monkeys, the apes, uh, the humans. Uh, also in there are the platyrines, and that includes the uh, the cebits and the, and the uh, calithricids. 
So uh, what we want to do now is just simply go through some of these major groups of the, of the haplorines. Uh, one important thing to remember is that all of these uh, haplorines have a hemochorial placenta. So uh, that's the typical sort of a eutherian mammal placenta that has a lot of surface area, a lot of invagination with the uterine wall, uh, and provides for a lot of transfer of nutrients and gases across the across the placenta. Also, all of these now have a post-orbital plate, so um, they have good binocular vision. Um, let's begin with the Tarsiids. Uh, there's a single genus that has five species. These are Indonesia, Malaysia, uh, and the Philippines. Uh, the fossils come from North America and Europe. And the cool thing about the tarsiers is that they have this extreme ability to rotate the head. Uh, so it's not like uh, um, The Exorcist, uh, the film The Exorcist, where the young girl turns her head, uh, you know, 360 degrees, but they are able to turn it uh, quite some distance. Um, this includes uh, vertical clingers and leapers. They are both nocturnal and crepuscular, so not any diurnal forms. Uh, they eat insects, lizards, spiders. Uh, if it moves, they'll take it, basically. Uh, so here's a nice example of a Bornean tarsier. Um, so you can see that it would be um, have good nocturnal vision, binocular vision, and obviously because of the proportions, also uh, a good vertical clinger and leaper. Um, interestingly, uh, these animals form pair bonds, uh, and these pair bonds last for quite some time, and the pair bonds are territorial. Um, they produce a single precocial young, um, so um, it's more uh, human-like, I suppose, than you would expect to see in other sorts of uh, mammal groups. Uh, let's look at the foot morphology um, of these animals. Uh, on the far left, you see the foot of a lemur. Uh, on the far right, you see the foot of a gorilla, and in the middle, you see the foot of a tarsier. Uh, and obviously, um, if you look at those proportions, uh, the base of the foot, so the calcaneus and the astragalus, are quite long. Uh, and that's exactly what you would expect to see in an animal that's lengthening the foot. And that clearly is something that's uh, affiliated with vertical clinging and leaping, particularly with the leaping portion of all of this. Um, then let's uh, let's go back and compare the skull of a strepsirine, uh, namely Galago, with that of a haplorine, a tarsius, uh, and notice the size of the orbit. Uh, so these animals have exceptionally large eyes, and uh, clearly uh, that's related to nocturnality. So not only binocularity, but also uh, this ability to see in the night. Uh, you'll notice the same sort of pattern when you look at rodents. Uh, nocturnal rodents tend to have very large eyes, and that's all about light gathering. Uh, the bigger the aperture, the more light you can capture, and obviously the greater the visual acuity. Um, again, look at the teeth on Galago, which is the strepsirine, uh, those spatulate uh, canine, or rather the uh, incisiform canine. Um, in tarsiers, most of those incisors are going to be spatulate instead. So. Uh, the basic bunitant, um, uh, brachydont dentition remains, but those incisors are now going to be uh, fundamentally different. Um, let's switch now and look at uh, the first group of wor New World monkeys, and these are um, monkeys in the family Cibidae. Um, lots of different genera, so 11 genera, lots of different species, 58 species. These are animals that are going to be uh, in Central America and South America. Um, the obvious forms are howler monkeys, capuchins, spider monkeys, uh, sakis, uh, wakaris, and then woolly monkeys. Um, howler monkeys, uh, there used to be a pair of howler monkeys at the, um, at the St. Louis Zoo in the, in the primate house. Uh, they're long since gone, but it was really cool to go in and watch those howler monkeys, uh, especially when they would begin to vocalize. Uh, they have these big guler sacs that they involve in their vocalizations and it's pretty impressive to hear these guys. Uh, you should spend some time on YouTube and, and look at some videos of howler monkeys howling. Uh, one sad note, uh, my pro major professor when I was a um, uh, master student in California was James Dale Smith and when he was a PhD student at the University of Kansas he was on a collecting trip uh, in Central America, I think they were in Nicaragua, 
uh, and he collected 3,000 howler monkeys on one collecting trip, uh, which in my view is a uh, extreme, excessive sort of thing to do. Uh, I don't think anybody should have the right to collect 3,000 of any one species. Um, but he took great pleasure in describing uh, how howler monkeys died uh, because he obviously shot them. Um, he took great pleasure in that. Um, he was just an odd individual in so many different ways. At any rate, um, the seabids are primarily herbivorous and frugivorous, um, but there are some of the smaller forms that are eating insects and small mammals as well. Um, so here's an owl monkey, uh, which is a seabid. Um, and uh, what you'll notice uh, with these guys um, is that oftentimes males will carry um, the infants, so there is a lot of sharing of parental duties in, uh, in primates. Um, these are black-capped um, capuchin monkeys. Uh, there, we have some of those at the St. Louis Zoo. You should spend some time the next time at, you're at the zoo going into that primate house uh, and watching these. Uh, another thing that I want to point out here, um, notice what these animals are doing with their tails. Uh, so New World uh, monkeys, both the cebids and the um, calithricids, have prehensile tails. Uh, the Old World monkeys do not. Uh, so one of the ways you can tell the difference between a New World and an Old World monkey is on the basis of whether the tail is prehensile or not. Uh, prehensile tails occur only in the New World. They are not there uh, in, the, in the Old World monkey. So in the Cercopithecid monkeys, they do not have a prehensile tail. Uh, and you might ask yourself, why is that? Uh, why would prehensile tails not evolve in the Old World, only in the New World? Uh, and the answer to that, I think, uh, lies with the actual physical structure of the habitat. Uh, and I think if you look at the distribution of lianas, that is vines, uh, in the New World versus the Old World, I think you'll find your answer. All right, so um, these four, they're, within the Cibidae, there are four genera um, that have prehensile tails. Um, most also have prehensile hands. Um, but the thumb is only sort of pseudo-opposable, so it's not fully opposable like it is uh, with us. Um, Aotus and um, Calicebus um, both form monogamous groups, while all the others are polygamous. Uh, and when I say polygamous, what I really mean is polygynous. Okay, so there will be one male and then many females. Um, and some of these polygynous groups will have as many as 100 individuals in the group. Uh, so now let's compare um, what the skulls of something like an eye eye looks like. That's at the bottom. So remember, that's a strepsorine. Uh, and compare that um, with the haplorine form. And you see how fundamentally different um, the skull shapes are and the jaw shapes as well. And obviously, there are a lot of differences with the, um, with the incisors as well. Uh, the calithricids, that's the other group of New World uh, monkeys. Here there are five genera and 26 species, and that includes the marmosets and the tamarins. Uh, so these are predominantly small forms. If you go to the St. Louis Zoo, you'll see the, uh, um, the, lion, uh, the lion tamarin, uh, cotton top tamarins, and those sorts of guys. Uh, the cotton top tamarins look a lot like, um, what's the character from Star Wars, the um, Yoda or whatever his name is. Um, that's essentially what they what they look like. Um, they're quadrupedal, but they can hop. Um, they have prehensile hands, uh, but they don't have the uh, um, opposable thumbs. Uh, so here you see a uh, golden lion tamarin. Uh, they're called that because that golden orangish fur that they have around their faces looks very much like um, the mane of a lion. Um, Geldis monkey, um, which is a which um, um, is sort of odd in relationship to all the others, and that it only produces one uh, offspring at a time. Um, these guys also are relatively small. They're not; these are not um, big animals. Um, the calithricids in general live in extended family groups, um, so there will be a monogamous pair, um, and then there may be as many as fifteen other individuals within that group, and. Uh, those individuals are going to be offspring and nephews and nieces and, and things of that sort. So there is a genetic relatedness amongst the individuals that are in those um, groups. Uh, they, main ter they main territories, and sometimes those territories are quite large. Um, there is a, a lot of interest in how these calithricids uh, are subdividing the habitat. 
Uh, and there are some situations where you will have two different species of calothricids uh, living in the same area uh, with essentially the same diet. Uh, there was just a paper recently in the Journal of Mammalogy uh, going uh, investigating some of these odd sort of relationships amongst different species of uh, calothricids in New World uh, tropical forests. And what they discovered was that when there are two different species occupying the same habitat, um, although they may be eating the same uh, food items, there's one species that is going to occupy a different layer within the forest than the other. So uh, one will, for will forage primarily in the upper canopy and the other will forage uh, primarily on the ground or in the middle canopy. All right, um, so that's something to pay attention to. Um, it is sort of a, an interest ecological um, thing that's going on. Um, all right, so... Uh, as before, there's uh, communication is via olfaction, vision, um, and uh, pheromones via urine and so on. Um, if we look at uh, a marmoset versus an eye-eye, uh, you could see that uh, the teeth are primarily different, size of the eyes are different, and so on. Um, but notice with the, the marmoset how large the brain case is relative to the overall skull. So we're talking about animals that have um, a lot of uh, cognitive capacity compared to other sorts of mammals. Uh, and then you can also uh, begin looking at the feet. So here's our feet from a tarsier, uh, a marmoset, a spider monkey, and then the gorilla in the lower right. And again, remember a big thing about um, primates is what's going on with the hands um, and the feet. Uh, boy, where, where did we see that before? We saw that with the marsupials. So structure of hands uh, and feet uh, is generally related to locomotion, uh, your ability to manipulate things, your ability to get around in the habitat. That's true for marsupials, and that's certainly true for primates as well. Uh, now the Cercopithecids are the old world monkeys, um, and here there are 18 genera and 81 species, and these are uh, Africa and Asia and in the Malay, uh, Malay um, archipelago. Um, in general, uh, males have large canines, um, and females have these um, ischial tuberosities, these uh, perennial uh, swellings. Um, and the other thing that's going on with these is what's happening in terms of the color patterns that you see on the faces. Uh, it turns out that in these animals, um, the nonverbal communication turn is, is really a, important. Um, I want to say something about those uh, swellings, so let me go ahead here. Um, and show you that. Here's a, a slide, um, which um, are a couple of macaques, um, and there's the male sitting down. The male is, is larger than is the female, uh, and the female has these ischial tuberosities. Uh, for a number of years, they had a um, uh, some baboons in, in the primate house at the St. Louis Zoo. They're no longer there. I don't know what became of those animals. Um, but there was a single dominant male in that polygynous group. And he would sit there with his back to the to the window, and he was obviously the largest animal in the um, in that troop. And then there were a number of females that had these ischial tuberosities, these swellings on their butts. And those ischial tuberosities become inflamed. And if you're just uh, you know visiting the zoo and you see that, the first thought that crosses your mind is that this is some sort of raging infection or something. It's not. Um, as the hormones cycle in these females, those things swell up and they become very red and bright and just very large and turgid. Um, and the females will parade in front of the male and present themselves to the male. Uh, and the male will look at the female, he'll lift her tail, just take a quick look, and if he um, assesses that she's not yet ready for a copulation, he'll just drop the tail and ignore her, and they keep cycling around in front of him until finally he'll find one where there's a sufficient amount of swelling, and he says, yeah, she's ready, and then he'll mount her and mate with her. Um, but it's not like it is in in uh, bonobos or in human primates uh, where there's some level of recreational sex. In these animals, it's strictly business. It's just uh, for the purposes of producing offspring and nothing more. Um, it is sort of a extreme when you see these sorts of displays on, on these circopithecids, uh, and a lot of people that see it, the humans are actually much more disgusting about how they view it and address it and talk about it than are the, um, the animals themselves as they're going through this very sort of traditional kind of uh, reproductive 
um, behavior. All right, um, so um, there are two groups within the uh, circa, two major groups within the Cercopithecids um, uh, subfamilies. Uh, the other subfamily, aside from the Cercopithecines, are the colobines. Uh, the colobines are the colobus monkeys. Um, and unlike something like a howler or something like that, they don't have uh, cheek pouches, um, but they do have um, um, sacculated stomachs um, and they have large salivary glands, not salicary glands, but large salivary glands, and they are folivorous. So the salivary glands are gonna aid in the um, early digestion of the cellulose. Um, they're arboreal, um, but they don't have um, uh, prehensile tail. So here's an animal that lives in a tropical environment, and it's a black animal, and they have these long, it almost looks like they're wearing a long white cape, and then the tip of the tail is white. The tails are not prehensile, so they are old world. Um, they're just absolutely gorgeous animals. And the question that you have to ask yourself is, why would they have such a stark contrast um, in these color patterns? And uh, and the answer is uh, probably related to the habitat that they're in. So in the tropics, those tropical forests, especially up in the canopy, it can be quite dark. Uh, so by having these stark sorts of contrasts within the pelage makes identif identification of conspecifics uh, easier. And that may be what it's all about. So the Cercopithecids, uh, they have social groups that range from solitary individuals or pairs, as you saw in the previous slide, um, to groups of 100 or more. Um, so most of these groups are polygynous. That is, there's going to be one male and then many females. Um, and of course, what that means then is that there's going to be a pretty fierce competition amongst males for uh, access to the females. Uh, so it's a, a harem system. And just like in humans, uh, the male that controls the harem is the one that's the smartest or the strongest or has the most resources or something of that sort. And the females are actually choosing the male on the basis of uh, his resources. Um, here's a, a baboon. We talked a little bit about baboons all, already. Um, baboons do a lot of really interesting behaviors when they in their groups. Uh, when baboons are moving or when they feel threatened by uh, predators, uh, what will happen is the males will, um, especially the larger males, will be on the outside of the group as they're moving, and all the younger individuals and the females will be on the interior of the group. Uh, and there's some wonderful footage in um, uh, video footage, and you can find it on YouTube, where um, one of these uh, baboons will be attacked by, um, uh, by a leopard. And it's really cool. Um, it's really cool to watch because at some point this baboon is going to turn and face the cat, and bear its canines and open its mouth and just vocalize, and it catches the attention of that cat. And oftentimes the cat will back off, realizing how extensive these canines are and how much damage could be done to the cat if it tries to take down the baboon. Uh, so it's they're pretty impressive animals. All right, uh, the hylobatids, um, there are, um, um, uh, this is one of the two families of apes. The two families of apes are the hylobatids and then the hominids. Uh, we are in the hominids. Um, the hylobatids um, probably should, well, they should be really uh, lumped in with the, um, with the other apes. Uh, and I indicated earlier the reason they're not is uh, just because of the outrage that you would get from the uh, religious right about, you know, or from the anti-evolution crowd uh, about how this isn't possible and how humans are somehow special and so on. Um, but uh, hylobatids in every other way uh, really do belong with um, the humans and the orangutans and the gorillas and the bonobos and the other chimps. Um, so there's one genus of uh, hylobatids and then 11 different species. All right, uh, let's just uh, very quickly sort of summarize uh, what's going on here with uh, with our definitions of, of primates. Um, and notice what happens in this uh, phylogeny. Um, you see that PMS, that's sort of the base of this, uh, of this cladogram. And the first branch that comes off, uh, those are the insectivores. And remember, we talked about insectivores and things of that sort. 
uh, and the tree shoes and the tapiads and all of, of that kind of stuff. So the insectivores are the, the sort of primordial mammal. And then coming off next are going to be the elephant shrews. Uh, you saw the little video clip of the elephant shrew from the zoo in Helsinki, Finland. Uh, next are the tree shrews, which are these squirrel-like, almost lemur-like um, animals. Uh, it's a question, are they primates? Are they not primates? And then, of course, we have uh, the strepsorines, the lemurs and the lorises and galagos and all of those sorts of groups. And then come the tarsiers, the new world monkeys, the old world monkeys, and, and then the apes. So just keep that phylogeny uh, in mind. You realize that, you know, it's the grades and clades argument. So what really is a primate? You know, where do you draw the line for primates? Should the primates include the elephant shrews, the tree shrews? Um, where do you draw that line? Should the uh, strepsorines be included with the rest of the primates? Um, it's all just terminology, right? All right, so back to the hylopatids. Um, these are Asian and, and the Malay um, archipelago. Um, these are the gibbons and the cymangs. Um, and the cool thing about all the hylobatids is that these facial features are set off with fur. Uh, so these are true brachiators with opposable thumbs and forelimbs. They're arboreal folivores, they're frugivores. Um, but the big deal about, aside from the formal locomotion, the big deal about these guys is the fact that their facial features are um, are illustrated, are marked off, are highlighted uh, by patterns of fur and coloration, just as in some of the um, some of the um, circopathicids. What that tells you at these is that these guys are using nonverbal, nonvocal communication, just as we do. Uh, if you've uh, lived with a person for a long time, you can tell by that person's facial expression what kind of mood they're in. Right? You can generally tell by looking at a person if they're happy or sad or angry or whatever. That's all nonverbal communication, and that is present in these hylobatids in spades. Uh, so here at the top, you see a, a galago, a vertical clinging and leaping. Below that is a, is a terrestrial quadru quadrupedal um, uh, baboon. Below that is a, is a cymang, which is you know a brachiator, a vertical clinger and leaper. And then at the bottom is... Um, uh, hominid, right? So something that's uh, bipedal. Uh, so the hylobatids uh, um, are in, in large family groups, but they are monogamous, and what you'll find is a monogamous pair with uh, with their offspring. Uh, the males do provide parental care. Uh, they are territorial, and they sing, and both sexes uh, vocalize via um, the singing behavior. Uh, so here's a, a silvery gibbon, uh, and you can see that it, it is, by the long uh, appendages, you can see that it is a brachiator. Um, now, thinking just for a moment about brachiation, uh, uh, what would you expect to see in the scapula of an animal that is a brachiator? Um, so the forces that are going to be applied to that shoulder joint are different than they are in an animal like us or in an animal um, that's quadrupedal. And in fact, back in the 1950s, there was a fellow by the name of Oxnard that asked exactly that question. Uh, and he, he started this very complicated statistical analysis trying to describe the shape differences that are, that are there in those scapula. And it's very, very difficult to work through and it's very difficult um, to sort of interpret all of that, those results. Things nowadays are much easier with the advent of geometric morphometrics, where it's much easier to look at shape. Um, and there have been some recent papers uh, which have looked very carefully at the shape of scapulas in animals that are uh, bipedal, uh, brachiators, uh, quadrupedal, uh, and fossorial, and so on. And we're really beginning to understand what's going on with the scapula. And if you think about it, all the muscles that are attaching to the to the scapula are going to, and how large the surface area for origin or insertion is, you know, what the angles are, all of that sort of stuff is going to influence how these animals are able to use their um, appendages. And there are significant differences in the shapes of these scapulas in animals that are brachiators versus animals that glide or animals that fly or animals that are quadrupedal. Uh, you might look at that literature at some point. It is really fascinating stuff. 
All right, let's move on now to the hominids. Uh, that's our group. Um, there are four genera and five species. They are um, the gorilla, uh, so gorilla, gorilla, although there are two different groups of gorillas. There are the lowland gorillas and the um, highland gorillas. Uh, neither group is doing well. Um, both are likely to go extinct uh, within your lifetime. Uh, then there are, um, is, uh, there are um, the chimpanzees, uh, so the troglodytes, and then uh, panpaniscus, so the regular chimpanzees, and then the um, bonobos. Um, then there's the orangutan, and then there's homo sapiens. None of these animals have a tail that's exposed beyond the skin. So we all have tails, right? We all have caudal vertebrae, but none of those caudal vertebrae project out beyond the skin. And they all have case-selected life histories. That is, um, that is, there is uh, relatively few offspring are produced in a lifetime, and a lot of uh, energy is invested in those offspring. Um, so it's not the R selected where you produce lots of offspring and invest little energy in each. We have the opposite strategy. And one consequence of that is that we have a tendency to live longer. So we produce few offspring. We're minimizing the probability of death and then uh, producing few offspring and investing lots of resources in each. Um, orangutans, uh, which are um, brachiators, um, have large home ranges. Um, and the male home ranges are designed to overlap with the maximum number of females possible. Um, they're folivorous, but oftentimes if they encounter insects or birds or small mammals, they'll consume those as well. And unfortunately, they're found only in Borneo and Sumatra. And that's unfortunate because the rate of deforestation in both Borneo and Sumatra is um, intense. Uh, and it's unlikely that these um, gorgeous animals are going to uh, survive your lifetime. So by the time uh, you're my age, you can imagine that these animals will uh, be on the cusp of extinction. Uh, they're, they're critically threatened now already. Uh, chimpanzees are in Central Africa. Um, they are sexually dimorphic with um, males being larger. Um, they do consume meat, at least Pantroglodytes consumes meat. Um, they live in groups of uh, 12 to 100 for pantroglodytes, tr um, troglodytes, and then smaller groups for the bonobo chimpanzees. Uh, speaking of, of chimpanzees, um, just uh, a few points that I, I want to make out. Um, the chimpanzees are the group that are um, our closest relatives. So if you were to look at a phylogenetic tree, uh, chimpanzees and humans are close. We have a common ancestor with them. Um, and in, in that regard, you can uh, imagine that you would expect to see a lots of behaviors, uh, particularly in bonobos, that you also find in, in humans. Uh, one of the interesting things that you find in bonobos is both um, some degree of, of recreational sex and also some degree of homosexuality amongst the males. Um, and what ends up happening is that the males are using copulatory behavior uh, in an effort to, they practice that copulatory behavior with one another before attempting to mate with females. Um, so uh, in humans, that same sort of behavior is, is there, right? Copulatory behavior amongst males. Um, and the only reason I point that out is because that, that sort of behavioral jump from that sort of behavior to true homosexuality or whatever isn't that big of a jump. We shouldn't be surprised to see those sorts of behaviors in humans. It's not, it's not um, what some people would have you believe, that it's aberrant or evil or anything of that sort. It is just another human behavior. That's all. All right, um, amongst the gorillas, uh, they are sexually dimorphic. Um, males can be up to 180 kilos. That's a big animal. Um, uh, they are in the tropical rainforests of East Africa and West Africa. Um, they are both folivorous and frugivorous. Uh, they are absolutely um, spectacular animals. Uh, George Schaller um, wrote a book on uh, gorillas and he had this very interesting experience and remember, I, I um, have been talking a little bit about behavior. A lot of the behaviors that gorillas have are the same behaviors that we as humans have. 
Um, and that's expressed in how they show dominance and how they show submission. Uh, and if you've ever been around, um, if you've ever been around high school boys, right, how they uh, show dominance or whatever, they puff up their chest and all that kind of stuff. And they try and make themselves look bigger and skinny guys will wear big, heavy jackets or whatever, trying to make themselves look bigger. The same sorts of things happen with gorillas. At any rate, George Schaller was uh, in the forest and um, found this abandoned gorilla baby. And he picked the baby up and he carried it through the forest until he came to a clearing. And across this clearing, he could see this, this group of gorillas. And the silverback, the dominant male, saw George Schaller and saw that George Schaller was holding this baby gorilla. And it was obviously this gorilla's offspring. So this gorilla comes charging across this meadow right at George Schaller. And George Schaller just stood his ground and just waited for the, the big silverback male to mow him down, basically. And right before the silverback male came, right, right before he was on top of George Schaller, George Schaller bowed, he put his head down, so he broke eye contact, eye contact, held the baby out in his arms, the gorilla stopped, picked up the baby, turned, and walked away. In order to do that, I mean, any normal person would have peed in their pants by that point, but George Schaller understood enough about primate behavior and gorilla behavior to realize that's all that was required. If you ever, if you're a male and you're going around the, the mall when there are a bunch of, you know, teenage boys walking around, uh, you can do the same sort of little experiment. Uh, when you encounter some teenage boys as a male, it doesn't work if you're a female. All you have to do is make eye contact with one of the males. If the other male that you're making eye contact with is smaller than you, he will look away, look down, somehow try to break contact and minimize the chance that he's going to get beat up. If he's bigger than you, he's not going to look away. He's going to maintain eye contact and attempt to assert his physical dominance over you. And it's very difficult under those circumstances to look away, right? And you'll notice what his posture is, right? His hands are going to clench up, his elbows are going to bend, and he's ready to beat the snot out of you or something. Those are exactly the sorts of behaviors that you would see in gorillas. So the difference between the behaviors of humans and gorillas are not great at all. All right, so we indicated that there were two populations of gorillas, the West African forms, which have relatively small groups. Um, they're folivorous and frugivorous. And then the East African gorillas, which are folivorous um, and have larger groups that will have uh, just a single silverback male. So that's the dominant male. Now, within the hominids, um, communication is via facial expression, chest thumping and vocalizations. And that's exactly what we do as well. Okay, um, so let's compare now the skull of a cercopithecid, which is the baboon on the left, and then the gorilla on the right. And you'll notice the sagittal crest on the gorilla, um, the brow ridge, um, and that basic, that basic skull shape. That basic skull shape is not all that different from what you see in humans. Obviously, in humans, uh, the cranial case is much larger and the rostrum is somewhat shorter. And it turns out that the real difference between us and something like a gorilla, the real difference is can probably be traced down to just a couple of genes. And those are genes, these sort of control genes, on-off switches, that determine when the face stops developing and when the cranium stops developing. And what happens in, if you look at the chimpanzee, or rather the um, the baboon versus the gorilla, notice how big the rostrum is and how small the cranium is compared to the gorilla. So if during development you turn off the genes that control growth of the rostrum and you leave the switch on that allows for growth of the cranium, you get this sort of allometric pattern. And that allometric pattern then results in a bigger cranium and a smaller face. You take that to the extreme, and that's what you get in humans. Because our skull, compared to the gorilla, is even more extreme yet. Our rostrum is shorter still, and our cranium is larger still. So we've just thrown those switches, 
and we get this sort of extreme version of the gorilla, and that's us. All right, so in humans, um, we have a lineage that is probably older than 10 million years. Um, it probably goes back quite a bit more than that. Um, we have erect bipedalism, uh, we have sexual dimorphism, we're gracile, and our mating systems are everything from polygyny to polyandry. Um, and I think we've talked about that in the past already. A polygynous system is when there's one male and, and many females. Uh, we have that now in the U.S. That's what the Mormons do. That's what, you know, King Abdullah of Saudi Arabia does, right? That's what uh, Saddam Hussein did. That's what um, all those guys are doing in, in the Middle East. Okay. Um, polyandrous is when there's one female and many males. We have that too. In general, those are um, systems that, for example, uh, prostitutes, female prostitutes would be in a polyandrous system where she's the um, dominant female and then all of her customers are uh, the many males. Uh, then, of course, in addition to that, communication is complex in us, but it's complex in chimps and gorillas as well. If you look at sort of the lineage for um, human primates uh, with uh, Homo sapiens up there at the, uh, the upper right, uh, don't worry about all the names and all the different groups. Pay attention, though, to what's going on to the shape of the skull. Uh, and the key thing is notice what happens to the size of the rostrum. And notice what happens to the size of the cranium. That's exactly the same trajectory that you see in that transition from something like a baboon to a gorilla. We're just at the extreme end of that. So there's nothing really all that special about us other than we have this disproportionately large skull. Is that an, ad is that an advantage? Well, it possibly is, but so far that hasn't been demonstrated. Well, you might argue that we are the dominant species on the planet, and that is likely true, although um, the coronavirus has simply challenged us in that regard. Um, and of course, cockroaches do quite well too, as do many other insects. Um, the, the issue isn't settled because we have not yet demonstrated that we're going to get through this, uh, the current uh, mass extinction event that we're in, right? There is no guarantee that we get through that mass extinction event. And clearly, as demonstrated in this last uh, presidential election, um, our ability to think critically and really to evaluate evidence and things of that sort is somewhat suspect, right? Um, if it's possible for people to build arguments that are that are clearly not founded uh, in fact or reality or science or whatever, it becomes questionable about whether it's going to be possible for us to get through this um, mass extinction event. All right, uh, we're going to stop there, um, and uh, I will see you guys next time. Uh, please check the website for any updates. Great. Talk to you guys later.